SEPS is Demystifying a Seminar About Sepsis. Were you late for the sepsis seminar presented by Dr. Bram Roshwig? Or were you just overwhelmed from that information overload? Well, don't worry, because we've got you covered. So what is sepsis? Currently, sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. If unmanaged, sepsis can progress into septic shock, which is a subset of sepsis in which underlying circulatory and cellular metabolic abnormalities are profound enough to substantially increase mortality. To clinically diagnose sepsis, there needs to be a suspected or documented infection, as well as an acute increase of two or more sulfa points. So now that we have an understanding of what sepsis is, the question becomes, how do we manage this condition? The answer to that question? Sepsis 6. Sepsis 6 is a set of strategies physicians utilize within the first three hours of the presentation of a septic patient. However, before we can actually get into the details of sepsis 6, it is important to understand that when managing sepsis, early identification is crucial. Reducing the time to diagnose severe sepsis is a critical component of reducing mortality and improving prognosis. The sepsis 6 is divided into three diagnostic items and three action procedures that are outlined here. The first step of sepsis 6 involves the delivery of oxygen. Oxygen therapy is a critical step as limited oxygen perfusion leads to many of the complications associated with sepsis. Oxygen can be administered via mechanical ventilation, whereby patients receive oxygen through a face mask. Step 2 involves sending off cultures. This includes blood as well as urine cultures. The step is important as it allows us to identify what the exact source of the sepsis is. Specifically, what type of bacteria are we dealing with? This is important when deciding what type of treatment to use. Step three involves the administration of intravenous antibiotics. Based on the results of the culture samples that we sent in the previous step, we can now accurately identify the source of sepsis. And this is where antibiotics and source control comes into play. Clinicians usually administer intravenous antimicrobials within the first hour of recognition of septic shock and severe sepsis. It is preferable if this initial therapy has activity against all likely pathogens. The overall duration of therapy is usually 7 to 10 days, with longer courses usually occurring for those with slower clinical responses. Step 4 involves measuring lactate. Due to reduced perfusion of oxygen to the tissues, the cells of our bodies begin to shift to anaerobic respiration, thus producing more lactate. Higher concentrations of lactate indicate lower levels of oxygenated blood. Lactate measurements are obtained through blood serum samples. A lactate concentration of greater than one millimole per liter indicates low oxygen blood saturation. Step 5 involves the administration of intravenous fluids. For this step, Crystalloids are recommended as the initial fluid of choice in the resuscitation of severe sepsis and septic shock. The most commonly used crystalloid is normal saline, which is a solution of sodium chloride at 0.9% concentration. In patients requiring substantial amounts of crystalloids, albumin use is recommended. Last but not least, the patient's urine output needs to be constantly tracked as low urine output suggests reduced blood pressure, which in turn increases the likelihood of a patient going into shock. Clinically, a patient's urine output needs to be constantly maintained at a concentration that is greater than or equivalent to 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Thank you for watching this presentation brought to you by Group 1 Productions as part of Demystifying Medicine.